All right, folks, um, welcome to today's talk, uh, Good Boys, Bad Hombres, The Racial Politics of Mentoring Latino Boys in Schools. I am Zis Leonardo, Professor of Education and Faculty of the Center for um, Research on Social Change, which sponsored today's event. I'm also a faculty of the critical theory designated emphasis. Okay. Um, this is both live and on Zoom. Um, for those folks in the room, which includes myself, please turn off our phones. There you go, I'm trying to model it. <laughs> uh, first, uh, before we get going here, uh, I wanna begin with a land acknowledgement. I wanna take a moment to acknowledge that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huichin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chacheni, Chechenyo Ohlone people. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. We recognize that even every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with the university values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and our commitment to hold the university more accountable to the needs of American, Indian, and indigenous peoples. Also, I would like to thank our co-sponsors, the Center for Race and Gender, or CRG, the Latinx Research Center, or LRC, the Center for Ethnographic Research, and my own school and department, the Berkeley School of Education. So the, the format of today's event is that after I introduce Professor Singh in just a second, uh, he will talk about his new book for about 45 minutes. Then we will have about 30 minutes for discussion. Those of you who, who are on Zoom can use the Q&A feature to enter your questions, and I will ask those questions on your behalf, okay? So let me get to the formal part, which I will amend with an informal part, sort of go off script. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Michael V. Singh an assistant professor in the Department of Chicanos, Chicana Chicano Studies at UC Davis, just down the road. Prior to that, he was a UC President's Postdoctoral Fellow in the department, which he took with him to the Department of Chicana Chicano Studies at UC Santa Barbara under the supervision of Professor Aida Hurtado. Prior to that, he received his PhD from the Berkeley School of Education, one of our own. So this is really a nice homecoming for Michael where I had the pleasure to work with him as his um, dissertation advisor and collaborator. So really, it's a pleasure to see you again, Michael. While he was here, he was a graduate fellow of the ISSI right here and a recipient of a grant from the Center of Race and Gender, for Race and Gender Studies. Dr. Singh's research is guided by questions of racial and gender justice in schools with a focus on Latino men and boys. His work ranges from ethnographic portraits of youth programs to policy-oriented studies with Latino men teachers. His second line of research advances critical theories of race and Latinidad in education. Singh's work has been published in leading journals such as the Harvard Ed Review just recently, AERJ, and several others. His new book he will discuss with us today. I will also add that he is a, a recipient of a second postdoctoral fellowship from the National Academy slash Spencer program. So he's a uh, twice awardee of two, two pre prestigious uh, postdocs. So that's the formal bit. I, I wanna sort of go off script a little bit and just give Michael a, a really nice welcome to the room and to the Zoomers. And it's been a pleasure to know Michael, not only one of the sharpest people I know, sharpest thinkers I know, but really one of the most genuine, warm people I, I, I've ever met. So um, I think both will show up today, his intellect and his warmth. So after the, 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 the talk, there will be a QA, and a um, and I will read some of those with Max uh, as far as from the Zoom, et cetera. And uh, we'll have a very spirited and lively q and I will take the last question at 1.25 and we will end at 1.30. Michael, welcome back to Cal and welcome back to ISSI. Um, tell us what you're up to. Okay. 
Thank you, Zeus, for that uh, introduction. As mentioned, my name is uh, Michael Singh. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Chicano, Chicano, and Chicanx Studies at UC Davis. Um, I'm also a former ISSI fellow. Um, I'm proud to proud to be one. Mm -hmm. I remember I was remarking. I remember. Um, let me bring my PowerPoint up here. Uh, I remember being a fellow and having folks come back to the center. Um, and I can remember um, Christine and, and Deborah and, and David welcoming folks um, and people just you know remarking how impactful it was for their career. And I, me thinking, wonderful, it'll be impactful for my career. I, you know, I was kind of feeling it, and it, it it definitely was. And I'm happy to now be here and um, similarly say, wow, thank you so much um, to you, uh, uh, Christine, and to David especially. Um, for um, making such an impact on my work. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so today I'll present an overview of my book, Good Boys, Bad Hombres, The Racial Politics of Mentoring Latino Boys in Schools. Uh, so this work comes from two years of ethnographic research with a Latino male mentoring program for middle and high school uh, Latino boys. This was my dissertation research. Um, and in the projects, I was interested in looking at the ways in which neoliberal shifts in urban education uh, reimagine Latino boyhoods in schools and beyond. So I'll give, go ahead and give the argument of the book up front. Um, I, I tell that to my undergraduates, you know, in our papers, uh, give me the argument right up front. And oh my gosh, it's, let's see, here we go. Uh, so this is a story about uh, power and resistance, I like to say. Um, so I argue that in the neoliberal era, school-based mentoring programs for Latino boys can paradoxically function as spaces of discipline and containment Deficit ideologies that frame Latino boys as problematic and broken impact the mission and everyday practices of these programs. This contributes to the creation of a narrow vision of who is a good boy, which becomes legible through discourses of ra racial respectability, heteropatriarchal value, and anti-Blackness, as an as, and is embodied by the figure of the la good Latino male role model. And this is also a story about resistance. Youth workers employ critical mentoring strategies and students engage in small movements of resistance enacted through repudiations of respectability, solidarity with classmates, and loving queer moments. A bit about how I entered this work. Um, so after my undergraduate degree, which was here at UC Berkeley in ethnic studies, I returned to my hometown of Woodland, California. And there I began working for the Yolo County Office of Education at a continuation high school, as well as uh, Dan Jacobs High School, the Yolo, Yolo County Juvenile Detention Facility. And there I was young, uh, running uh, after school program and uh, young men's circles. I was doing some after school tutoring. And I think I, I had the experience in education uh, that many men of color have. Uh, I encountered a discourse of scarcity that felt like the problems of boys of color were so large and yet we had so few men of color in the field of education to address these problems. This was a noticeable concern. There was a dis uh, and there was this kind of excitement upon my arrival. This excitement came from students and parents who were excited that I would build a meaningful relationships uh, with uh, Latino boys uh, and you know their their, uh, their children, and I was also excited to build build these, these meaningful relationships. Uh, but this excitement also came from teachers and principals who imagined that I would kind of turn attitudes and grades around. And I thought, um, yeah, I'm interested in that. Perhaps that's not the only reason I, I've come to work in schools. But uh, this this excitement also came from police officers and probation officers imagined in some ways that I would be an extension of their arms, policing and punishing students and removing the quote unquote troublemakers. And this, you know, if you know me, this is the exact opposite of why I was involved uh, uh, in education, in working in schools. And so when I returned to graduate school, I really wanted to think about uh, what Latino manhood meant in, in the classroom. And the following two questions kind of animate my research agenda, both for this book project, as well as my uh, continuing questions. And it is given the fear, surveillance, and punishment of Latino male bodies in US schools, why is the Latino male educator triumphed by such a diverse array of educational stakeholders as a legitimate agent of patriarchal power? And what are the ideological implications in framing quote unquote successful men of color as the educational saviors of boys of color? And what does this have to do with the reconstruction of race, gender, and sexuality in schools? Um, when you look at other book length ethnographies, you see this kind of a narrative of, of uh, or a focus of, of punishment. Um, I have uh, Victor Rios, who's a former ISSI fellow as well, a uh, book, Human Targets. Uh, Victor also has the book, Punished, which is widely taught. Uh, Tyrone Howard's uh, Blackmailed, Nancy Lopez's Ho Hopeful Girls and Troubled Boys, and Anne Ferguson's 
bad boys. And actually, for the, the title of my book is meant to signal uh, um, kind of a, a play on, on Anne Ferguson's bad boys. You know, my, my press ad had me uh, add the, the bad one, but this part, which uh, I was generally fine with, but, but originally the title was simply Good Boys. Um, in Ferguson's argument, you know, this, this book is now over two decades old. It's a, um, a year-long ethnography in a Southern California elementary school. And Ferguson, the ethnographer, enters the school and looks at the ways discourses of Black criminality uh, enter the schoolyard and um, create bad boys or, or uh, um, uh, Black young boys as kind of these um, um, deviant, punished um, uh, subjects. Um, she has this opening line where a school resource officer points uh, to a third grader and says, that boy is headed straight to a jail cell. Um, what my book is does is try to almost get at the other end of this coin. You know, if we have plenty of school-based ethnographies that look at the ways boys of color have been punished and pushed out of schools, uh, my book was interested in the ways in which we include them in the politics of inclusion. Um, building from a lot of this research, a lot of these ethnographies, the field of education has seen a turn towards men of color to address the issues of boys of color. Um, we see uh, increasing efforts to recruit and retain men of color in the field of education. I'm thinking of you know big programs like uh, New York City's um, men, uh, men Teach initiative to smaller uh, uh, initiatives in, in smaller districts. Um, there's also increasing effort to study the lives, pedagogies, and effects of men of color in education. In the field of education, there's a lot of uh, research funds uh, going to this. I think of places like uh, the Black Mill Institute at UCLA. And research shows that men of color provide uh, culturally relevant teaching, mentorship, and guidance uh, for struggling boys. So research definitely affirms that Few can touch the lives of boys of color like other men of color. Uh, there's also a research that suggests that just having more men of color on, on campus can kind of create a, a re, uh, create a culture of success for boys of color. That if you didn't necessarily see your identity aligning with educational attainment, now you have role models on campus, people that you see who have gone to college, and this can have a meaningful impact on your educational trajectory. And research also suggests that boys of color also like having men of color as educators. It is not necessarily that we just have um, policymakers that see the, the measurable improvements um, that men of color can make on the lives of, of boys of color, but the students themselves like having uh, educators that look like them. So if you get something from this, this uh, book, it's definitely not that we don't need men of color in the field of education, but that we should kind of think critically about the logics in which we use um, to make this shift. At the national stage, uh, former President Obama's My Brother's Keeper initiative that is an exemplar of, the, of this trend, uh, this White House initiative, which has later become a core feature of the Obama Foundation, um, didn't change the structure of schooling in any way, and I'll pro problematize that in a moment, but what it did do is bring a diverse array of educational stakeholders, folks from the private sector to become uh, mentors, to fund programs, after school programs, and seemingly try to uh, fund initiatives that would allow students to succeed in the structures that we currently have. There's also been a critique and um, caution to this turn towards men of color. One is concern for the masculinist narratives we tell. Uh, research shows that Black and Latino men educators often feel valued simply for their, dis their um, ability to discipline and punish boys of, of color, uh, which many men you know, don't feel that that's, uh, that's their primary role as educators. Um, also, often when we tell, when we imagine um, who is the ideal role model or, or mentor uh, for um, quote unquote struggling boys of color, we inevitably draw from kind of dominant discourses of masculinity. The ideal role model is seen as cisgender, straight, conventionally masculine. And Kimberly Kuntra um, her, herself has described programs like Mother, uh, My Brother's Keeper as an intersectional failure, in some ways obscuring uh, the, the struggles and racism experienced by women and gender and non-binary folks of color. There's also um, caution in, in critique of the uh, neoliberal racial logics in which we use to kind of tell this story rather than critiquing uh, and politicizing uh, the structures of schooling. We kind of become to imagine that school, uh, schools are, uh, can actually be, actually be changed through kind of these technocratic solutions uh, rather than kind of creating these activist movements. We think, oh, we, have, we need a movement of mentorship, a movement of guidance, a movement of leadership which just kind of reframes our approach to the troubles of urban education. Um, my kind of conceptual framework for this project was neoliberal multiculturalism. I know we've, we've come across this term a lot uh, in academia for this project. You know, uh, neoliberalism is an economic theory and social discourse promoting the notion that economies and humans function most efficiently when subject to unreg unreg unregulated free market capitalism. 
in schools uh, structurally. This looks like the rise of charter schools, uh, public-private partnerships, uh, uh, voucher programs, uh, philanthropy. But culturally, it looks like a movement to choice, to consumer freedom, to uh, individualism and entrepreneurism, that individuals will, will change the outcome of education. The term neoliberal multiculturalism describes the ways the neoliberal project adopts the rhetoric of diversity, inclusion, and racial equality, while still proffering the fundamental values of neoliberalism. Uh, this multiculturalist rhetoric manages the contradictions of neoliber neoliberalism as a form of racial capitalism by positing fundamental values of neo neoliberalism, such as entrepreneurialism, marketization, privatization, and economic liberty is integral aspects of racial equality. Neoliberalism is seen as not promoting racism, but rather, um, or, or neoliberalism, neoliberalism is seen as not uh, propagating racism, but rather promoting market ideals that are key to a post-racist society. Um, here, uh, we are engendering new racial subjects. Gone are the days in, of uh, strict color lines in schools. And in fact, under neoliberal multiculturalism, um, we can see a binary between the good multicultural subject and the racial other. These racial others are often marked through gender discourses as well, but communities of color is seen as not uh, properly performing a traditional heteropatriarchal fam familial arrangements. Um, and in, in regards to men of color in particular, uh, men are seen as not socialized to be the responsible patriarchs that communities of color need. So it's very much an invitation to a, a proper multicultural subjectivity. Um, so I have here a range of programs, and uh, none of the programs in which I studied and actually uh, Project Males uh, out of UT Austin uh, has funded this research in some way. So I'm very much a part of this um, kind of movement. But uh, lately we've been, um, we've seen um, an explosion of programs, and indeed an explosion of discourse surrounding what are the problems and solutions for boys and men of color? What does this population need and who and how will we fix them? And what my work does is I ask, well, what happens to a population like boys and men of color that have, puni have been punished and policed and pushed out of schools when they now become included in this larger neoliberal educational imaginary? And on whose terms does this population enter schools? Um, and what does this have to do with the reconstruction of race and gender and sexuality? Um, specifically for uh, my book, my research questions were, how are the educational struggles of Latino boys framed in the era of neoliberal multiculturalism? And what is the role of youth programs in addressing this struggle? How are, they intersection how are intersectional Latino boyhoods imagined and animated in boy of color programming? And how do Latino men and boys articulate educational justice with one another? Uh, so to do this, I conducted an ethnography with a Latino male mentoring program that I call Latino Male Success, or uh, LMS, and this is a pseudonym. It was located in Arroyo Seco, which is a mid or large sized city in California. It was established in 2010 and is run by Pueblo Unido, which is a large Latinx nonprofit. And again, indicative of neoliberal, uh, neoliberal shifts in urban education. This is a large nonprofit uh, running a school day mentoring program. It's not actually not even an after school program. Um, it's presently, or actually during the time of the study, uh, it was in 10 Oreo Seco Unified School District middle and high schools. In most cases, it functioned as a daily advisory course, which kind of studies class. Uh, the program em em employed 10 mentors, which were each assigned to a school site. Their ages ranged from 23 to 31 and all but held a bachelor's degree. The majority of mentors were of Mexican descent, all identified as Latinx. Um, uh, each mentor was responsible for roughly 15 to 25 students, whose ages ranged from 12 to 19 uh, of predominantly Mexican and Central American descent. And this meant that uh, roughly 6% of Latino boys in the district uh, were in the program at one time. Uh, this was not necessarily the most uh, vulnerable uh, population of Latino boys in each school had different criteria for how a student might come to take, um, uh, come to be a part of LMS. Uh, this was an ethnography, which included uh, document analysis, interviews, participant observations, and conversational interviews. Uh, documents included program literature and curriculum, uh, but also media clips and newspaper articles to look at the ways which the program was imagined kind of in, in the public eye. Uh, what was the issues of Royal Seco and how was this program addressing these issues? I conducted uh, formal interviews with uh, the 13 mentors that were employed with LMS over the two years I was with them, as well as 20 students. Um, I also interviewed uh, ASUSD and LMS administrators. Uh, I conducted participant observations for two full school years between August 2017 and May 2019. 
uh, I was at two middle school, uh, two middle school classrooms and one high school classroom each twice a week. And I also attended events and fundraisers, which were particularly um, illuminating to see how the program was presented to local philanthropists. Uh, and then I conducted conversational interviews with uh, school site staff, teachers, parents, really any, anyone who, who was uh, interested in, in talking to me. Um, I'll give a broad overview of my findings, and I won't get into everything uh, that the book covers, but I do like to kind of share uh, the larger findings. Um, so one is the LMS brought a damage and deficit orientation to mentorship. Uh, Latino boys were often framed as problematic and broken, and the district would address this problem in part by bringing in LMS, LMS to fix it. Uh, curriculum and everyday practices reinforced the notion that uh, the role of the Latino male mentor was to fix students, in part by instilling ne uh, neoliberal values through character development. Students both adopted as well as resisted uh, this in a variety of ways. And some mentors subverted their positioning as positive role models um, and described different visions of justice that they sought to enact in their classrooms. And like a good ethnographer, I want to start by reading uh, a field note. This is the field note that opens the book. Um, I'm not going to begin. So on a warm spring evening in 2018, I attended a dinner celebration at a local country club. Under a vast white tent perched on the edge of the golf course, Latinx families mingled with one another while helping themselves to a buffet-style dinner. The night's festivities, were, um, night's festivities were hosted by Pueblo Unido, a large Latinx nonprofit organization, and meant to celebrate the boys and families of Latino male success. The celebration, described as a ceremonia on the flyer, served as a rite of passage for boys who had completed a full year in the program. The centerpiece of the event was the keynote speech delivered by Refugio Perez on the perseverance of Latino males. Perez was born of humble beginnings in rural Guatemala and had risen above adversity to become success, a successful entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur. Throughout his career, he had worked for several of the world's largest corporations, which were advertised on the LMS Ceremonia Flyer, which included Tesla, Apple, Salesforce, Uber, and General Motors. He had also published multiple motivational books. His Amazon book page described Perez as the epitome of the American dream and the truest definition of a bootstrapper. The LMS program director introduced him to the crowd of parents, students, and LMS staff. Hola, familia, como están? shouted Perez. He was a charismatic speaker, addressing the crowd primarily in Spanish, but blending in English to reiterate an important point to address specifically the students. Throughout the speech, Perez reiterated the themes of hard work, grit, no excuses, and a steadfast belief in the American dream. However, beyond the content of the speech, there was a performative element that the keynote was meant to signal that the keynote meant to signal a physical transformation that an entrepreneurial mindset could ignite. As Perez's speech neared its end, he began slowly unbuttoning his casual shirt, revealing a clean and pressed dress shirt underneath. While continuing to deliver his message, he retrieved a bag from behind the stage and removed a necktie. He skillfully tied the necktie while maintaining eye contact with the crowd. He then removed a sports coat from his bag and put it on to finish his businessman ensemble. The transformation from a struggling boyhood to an empowered manhood was complete. The crowd stood up and applauded what had been a riveting performance. From across the hall, I made eye contact with Mr. Javier, a middle school mentor I had been shadowing throughout the school year. He shook his head softly, signaling his, his apparent discomfort with the speech. Mr. Javier taught critical race lessons in his classroom and resented what he had described as the corporate culture of Pueblo Unido. As we passed by one another later in the ceremony, he stopped me. We got to talk later about that speech, yeah? You know I'm not down with that message. I open with a scene to illustrate the ideological and at times embodied struggle over Latino manhood that I witnessed during my two years of fieldwork with LMS. At the center of this research is the ways the figure of the positive Latino male role model has come to guide the ways in which we reimagine proper and productive ways of being for students. So I'll go ahead and get into a few findings. So again, um, I can't go into everything in detail, but finding when Latino boys are framed through their neo neoliberal deficits. One was kind of this classic racial deficit that we see in the educational literature that practitioners know of, you know, uh, students have bad attitudes or prone to violence, uh, but there are also uh, gender deficits. The idea that Latino men might come from uh, machista households and not uh, be potentially lacking uh, traditional uh, masculine values. Again, of course, these were bound up together. Um, so in my research, um, LMS was constantly positioned as a response to a crisis, 
So it's not a crisis of gentrification, of police violence, of po poverty or housing insecurity, which I felt like were legitimate crises uh, in Oreo Seco, but it was actually a crisis of culture and problematic behavior. Uh, Latino boys were not succeeding and their character was seen at risk. Uh, this drew very much upon the image of the bad boy that I had mentioned in Anne Ferguson's work. Uh, boys were framed as, was, as deviant, but potentially productive. There was hope, something had to be done. And in part, uh, what would be done is boys would be changed in some way. That, and that's why the program uh, was explicitly um, framed, uh, not just framed, it, it described itself as a character development. Um, it is using a character development curriculum. A role model would embody what I felt boys were uh, posted as, as lacking. Absent from the narrative was race and racism. And as an, an ethnographer who was you know, going over field notes and listening to my first interviews, I became just fascinated that the term race or racism was never mentioned and continued to not be mentioned uh, throughout um, administrator interviews or in any documents of any sorts and newspaper articles. That was not the goal of the program to address racism. Um, this was uh, demonstrated in a lot of ways, but actually the way that I, that I am going to show for you now is the cuatro valores or the four values. Uh, these were the kind of the almost a, a mantra in the program. Uh, students had to memorize these four values. It was on uh, t-shirts, there was on posters, students all know, knew them. When you interviewed a student or a mentor, uh, these four values constantly came up as what is this program about. Um, having these values at the at core of LMS's school-based in intervention for Latino boys, I argue serves to frame Latino males through their potential to lack these values. Questioning their character and positing, positioning the students, they ask at risk of being dishonest, violent, irresponsible, and negative influences in their community. Uh, critical race scholars have consistently noted uh, how there's a short-sightedness and inherent racism uh, coded in a persistent focus on the character of structurally marginalized students. Now, these, although these um, core tenets were not innately problematic, a lack of political or structural reference at best gives them little meaning, and at worst normalizes the notion that Latino boys needed to develop a virtuous character that was presumably absent. Um, there's also a crisis of gender, uh, a, the idea that uh, uh, boys were from households that did not uh, embody traditional gender values. Machismo in the most kind of uh, toxic, stereotypical way was, was uh, constantly framed as uh, perhaps innate uh, in students' culture. Um, and in this way, racial deviancy intersected with a failure to enact uh, proper, and when I say proper, I mean heteropatriarchal masculinity. Uh, LMS would then instill a proper masculinity which was always traditionally heterosexual and patriarchal, uh, anti-sexist, but still upholding conventional, conventional heteropatriarchal values. And I consistently noted that there was an exclusion of queer or non-cisgender boys um, through a narrow definition of um, traditional masculinity. Um, I wanna, you know, oddly enough, you know, this is a quote from the program director and he mentions, you know, some of these boys are about to be young fathers. That's why character development is huge for us was um, jarring to see how much uh, the potential to be a father came up in a program that, you know, most of the schools were middle schools. Um, uh, there, there was oddly this, this odd blend of um, kind of conservative, uh, conservative values and, um, you know, uh, conservative sex education uh, that, that kind of entered the program. Um, I asked the, the program director, um, Hey, so I, I noticed, um, you know, in, in pointing this out in some of my actually early um, check-ins where I would give data back to the program and tell them about my preliminary findings that I mentioned. Um, hey, you know, we don't have a lot of curriculum for um, gay or trans students, or I, I don't know if that's been on your mind. I think that's something that maybe we could shift in the program director um, at the time. I mentioned first that they didn't have any uh, gay students, which was ludicrous in a program of hundreds of students. And, um, you know, I, I'd met many students and mentors, and come, well, yeah, I've, you know, I've met students that are gay before. Um, then, but then he shared this with me that, that I felt was uh, particularly illuminating. The director shares, uh, we've had a student uh, who is a female, but, but kind of like queer, they at the school were saying that she could be a part of our group. But the way the mentor approached it was, well, this kid is going to go through a lot of changes that I won't be able to, to help with, because I've never dealt with that. So in that instance, the understanding uh, with a student in the administration uh, and asked was that it would be best served if uh, she was not part of the, the circle. We would not know how to serve that youth. Um, in this account um, of an instance uh, years before my fieldwork began, we heard of a student interested in an LMS, a gendered space not assigned to them at birth, and they're denied entry to the program. 
However, the needs of a student are presented is beyond simply the scope and abilities of LMS, further revealing the limited and specific Latino male subjects envisioned by the program and affirming discourse surrounding an ideal cisgender and heteronormative Latino male subjectivity help to shape the gendered and sexual qualities of an imagined LMS student. This universal, universalizing practice rejects non-dominant gender performances and queerness by excluding or erasing them from the larger project of Latino male empowerment. So in this moment, it's, it's not that, uh, um, you know, the director is saying, oh, you know, we want the best for the student, but in Latino male empowerment, that's not that the student we're imagining. That's beyond the scope of our abilities. Again, further revealing you know, the narrow scope of, of um, what, what kind of um, boyhoods we're envisioning for this program. Um, I found that there, there was a discursive a construction of an idealized Latino manhood. It was always respectable, productive, and entrepreneurial, self-motivated, uh, prepared to be the future patriarch of a nuclear family, which again, uh, led, led uh, the ideal subject to be positioned as straight and cisgender. Uh, always articulated in opposition to imagine bad boy that existed within the school, but also within the community. And it, reconstruct, and it reconstructed a racialized divide between who were good and bad Latino boys. Not required in this kind of ideal student subject was students building a critical race or gender consciousness. Uh, and this was often despite students, um, you know, this acknowledgement that um, gender, and, uh, gender and sexuality and race were in some ways important. It, it was not actually at the center of the program. Um, finding two everyday practices, uh, everyday practices of, of neoliberal values. Um, so a few, but I'm going to focus on meritocratic individualism. Um, so I found that LMS classrooms often cultivated identities that centered around accountability. The idea that um, success or failure was a student's uh, choice was often uh, pushed by the program, and in part, um, you know, with the little resources mentors had available, you know efforts and dedication and accountability is what they could push. Um, Self-discipline and taking responsibility for actions were defining values in the program. Um, so in practice, this looked like a tough love, which mentors felt was um, something that they themselves were positioned to do and ideal um, people to give tough love to students. Monetary grade competitions. So students were constantly uh, in a monetary grade uh, competition with one another uh, six times throughout the school year, whoever had the top grades would get uh, gift cards. Uh, students could win this over and over again. And uh, middle and high school uh, students, you know, this was one of the, the most exciting things about the program is students were, couldn't, uh, couldn't wait for the, the money to be given out, but really kind of created this culture of uh, competition and equating good grades to money and bad grades to no money. Uh, this idea that a real man keeps their word, uh, especially in terms of uh, academic accountability. The program had practices like the exclusion of activities when a student's GPA dropped below a 2.5. Uh, this had a deep impact on how students imagined the problems uh, facing Latino boys, um, which we know are structural. Um, but when asked, you know, uh, why, why the uh, Latino boys uh, were not uh, doing well in school, why uh, LMS was there in the first place, um, students often, you know, this kind of directed them to more individualized um, responses, like it's just laziness. Some of them just want to be funny. They don't think so they don't take responsibility for actions, not like a real man. Um, Eric uh, shared with me once, um, because they don't do the work, simple as that. That's why I'm feeling, I was just being lazy, you know, slacking off, but I'm changing that. Uh, Eric, who I worked with for quite a while in the program, um, had been struggling, his, his family, it had to move to an adjacent city and he was struggling to get on time to school um, in part because of traffic uh, due to gentrification. Um, and Eric, despite you know, putting in some effort, um, his grades did not change a lot during the school year. Um, in the, the program in some ways enforced the idea that Eric himself should take responsibility for that, uh, for that outcome. Um, I wanna focus on monetary grade competitions for a moment, which, which I, as I mentioned, were, were fascinating. And I wanna note that uh, quantitative research, you know, there's large studies that, that look at um, the ways incentivizing students uh, will or will not lead to uh, increase, uh, increased grades. Um, there's been big studies back with cell phones or cash awards, and research is still very inconclusive. There's some large studies that directly show that, you know, even with this large sample size, we can't necessarily say that motivating students with money will lead to, to good grades. Um, but as ethnographic research um, can, let, can kind of reveal, these grade competitions can actually lead to just acceptance of uh, a normalization of general capitalist values. Um, so I want to share another field note. This is from 
Mr. Antonio's class. Um, and it starts, today in class, Mr. Antonio uh, made an unexpected announcement. The local NBA team had reached out to Pueblo Unido and offered to gift each LMS classroom several tickets to an upcoming basketball game against LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers. This was 2017. Um, the cause, um, this caused a murmur of excitement among the boys. Some squirmed in their seats, their eyes wide, uh, wide open, almost unable to believe the news. However, um, this moment of excitement was followed by a quiet groan from Diego. Diego was seated next to me. Diego was a young looking seventh grader, he had smooth, full cheeks, long hair, and an eclectic style that had led him to struggle to find his place in middle school. In middle school. However, one thing uh, most did know about Diego was that he adored the local basketball team. I turned to him in surprise, and he whispered to me, I won't be able to go, watch. A few seconds later, Mr. Antonio asked which students might be interested in attending. Diego reluctantly put his hand up. Put your hand on Diego, you can't have three Fs and expect to go to the game, said Mr. Antonio bluntly. Diego's eyes began to water a bit as he put his hand down. He whispered to me again, this time angrily, um, what about uh, people with bad grades? Don't we deserve to get fun things too sometimes? Uh, I think Diego had such a great point, especially uh, you know, as an educational researcher that knows that student, certain students uh, are disadvantaged within our um, structurally, structurally racist and violent school system. And yet in this way, um, we had a Latino male mentor who checked in with Diego after and said, hey, I'm so sorry I put that so bluntly. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, but you, you, know, you don't have the highest grades in the class. I, I can't justify giving you this. And I think it was reasonable for Diego to say, why not? You know, well, I, I think I, I should be the one to go. Um, however, uh, after this outcome, Diego um, you know, respected Mr. An Antonio, accepted the decision, and they continued to have a close relationship. Um, Diego's grades did not improve that school year. Funny dream. Uh, students both adopted and resisted these perspectives. Um, I'm actually going to jump over this because I, I don't have enough time to, to do this justice. Um, we're going to jump to finding for it. Some mentors resisted the neoliberal politics of empowerment. And I'm going to look at critical mentoring and queer disruptions. I'm going to start with another, um, oops, with another field note. Well, actually, first, so uh, this section focuses on two mentors in, in particular, uh, Mr. Javier and Mr. Agustin. Mr. Javier was uh, one of the older mentors in the program. He was 30 years old at the time. I shadowed him for two years. Um, he had been a mentor for five years in a middle school. Uh, he had gone uh, to college, but it was the only mentor without a bachelor's degree. He was from Oreo Seco. Um, he identified as heterosexual, and we had three in-depth interviews uh, beyond our participant observations. And then there was Mr. Agustin, who was one of the youngest mentors in the program. He was 23 at the time. I uh, was in his first year and actually first months as a mentor. Uh, he was a high school mentor. He'd recently got a sociology degree from UC Berkeley. I was from Oreo Circle, was the only mentor that identified it as gay, and we had two in-depth interviews together. Now I'll go to, and read a field note from Mr. Javier's classroom. The walls of Mr. Javier's middle school classroom were covered in protest art. Their bold and clear messages spoke directly to ongoing social and political movements affecting the North Oreo Circle community. Some of the posters read Abolish Borders, Black Lives Matter, and Oreo Seco Against Gentrification. The banner hanging above Mr. Javier's desk stated in graffiti style letters, if capital can cross borders, so can we. In today's class, Mr. Javier announced he would be doing one of his favorite lessons, which was not an official LMS activity, titled Roots of Oppression. Standing at the front of the classroom, Mr. Javier began asking the students to brainstorm some of the troubles and social ills they saw in their community. Some of the words and phrases included robbery, gangs, shootings, police shootings, trash, houselessness, violence, addiction, kids dropping out of school, and deportations. Once the brainstorming had finished, Mr. Javier began connecting the words with a brown marker till they resembled green leaves on brown branches. He linked the branches to a wide tree trunk and finally six large and intersecting roots. These roots were titled racism, sexism, classism, ableism, ageism, and homophobia. As the lesson continued, Mr. Javier and the students discussed the ways systems of oppression manifest in diverse and sometimes hidden ways in the Royal Cycle. Students conferred about how individual or interpersonal problems were often symptoms of larger, larger social and historical contexts. Towards the end of the lesson, Mr. Javier paused. He posed a question provocatively. You think we're making real change here in LMS? There was hesitation among the students. The consensus finally emerged, no. I agree, stated Mr. Javier. 
Um, he, can he continued, don't get me wrong, we do some amazing stuff in this classroom, but a program like this, it can't begin to get at those deeper issues. He then continued more seriously, and I think in many ways they don't want us to. While, re while reiterating his commitment to the success of his students, Mr. Javier declared, me being here is just a band-aid. I'm a band-aid and y'all deserve much more than a band-aid. This vignette describes one of what would be many occasions in which Mr. Javier's teaching challenged the notion that a mentor and role model was a viable solution for racial, for a, a solution for racial injustice in schools. Since the first day I met Mr. Javier, he'd been eager to communicate this belief with me. This was a mentor who was shadowing who, from the moment I came in and said, hey, I, I know you're doing a, a, you know, something I let me know about mentoring. Let me give you this perspective. And what I really found is in these spaces, you know, especially with you know, 10 mentors, you know, definitely not a monolith, you know, some mentors aspire to be police officers and probation officers, or, you know, what are you doing working in a mentorship program? And some <laughs> wanted to be teachers or school social workers, but we had very different ideas on what were the problems facing Latino boys and what a program like this could do to address those problems. Um, I found mentors like Mr. Javier and Mr. Agustin were subversive role models. They had strong criticisms of LMS and Pueblo Unido. Uh, they described them as uh, having conservative goals or bootstraps ideology or even a savior complex. Um, they also uh, critiqued the normalization of cis and heterosexual culture in the program. Um, both rejected uh, uh, the kind of image of the neoliberal superhero uh, mentor archetype that I had um, kind of been playing with in my, my research. Um, and they instead, you know, made the case for critical mentoring strategies, which is similar to critical pedagogy. Um, uh, in, uh, intentional refusal of being uh, traditional good examples, uh, more fluid and justice-centered approaches to role modeling, a focus on critical race awareness, and the need to queer the figure of the positive Latino male role model. So I want to end here by focusing on a few um, quotes that I, I just felt were illuminating. You know, this was Mr. Agustin on the limits and contradictions of role modeling. Uh, he shares, almost feels like deception, feels like uh, being this good role model, and he uses air quotes, we're telling them that if you work really hard, if you just focus, you don't talk during class, you will succeed. It ignores, but also hides a lot of those barriers that they that they face or that their whole community faces. Similarly, Mr. Javier says, we're put in a position to get kids to act a certain way, to change them. They, Pueblo Unido, don't want little free-thinking revolutionaries running around. They want real corporate-looking kids. He pretends to tighten a necktie and scrunches his, his face in an exaggerated manner. That's why they want to take the kids uh, to Morgan Stanley, so they can learn about how to be a part of the system, so that corporation can give to Pueblo Unido. Mr. Javier is mentioning a field trip that LMS took to the local uh, corporate office of Morgan Stanley, uh, investment banking firm. Actually, Mr. Javier refused to go, but shared with the students, hey, ask them, um, where's your house? And everyone's like, what do you mean, where's my house? And it's like, well, during the housing, like, how come they got bailed out, but we lost our houses? How come there's housing and security in our community? I thought that was just at this great, um, Kind of disruption to the narrative that investment banking firm, you know, that Morgan Stanley was in some way aligned with uh, with racial ju uh, justice, and Mr. Happy was saying, "Hey, I I I can't let you go to Morgan Stanley thinking." Um, Mr. Augustine also disrupted um, the what he describes as the straight Latino male narrative. Uh, he shared with me, "I feel like there's a lot of room for improvement in this area." Because if we operate from a belief that it's important for these Latino students to have Latino male role models that, that they look up to, you can't ignore that, well, unless I have the strong, I'm the only gay one here. Aside from providing Latino male mentors, it seems confused that we are also providing straight cisgender male mentors. So even though it may not be our intention to reproduce those power structures of male domination, the straight domination, it feels like it happens unintentionally. It feels like those are also being reproduced. Me just being here, bringing this up, disrupts the whole straight Latino male narrative. And he continues sharing, um, I always get asked by my students if I want to get married or have children. And I'm like, not really to the marriage, maybe to the kids, because a lot of the curriculum is like, we're trying to picture this path where you can be that responsible father and husband. Because I've never seen myself as um, in a husband role in the future. It was hard for me to be like, yes, this is what you would do, do that in the future, because that's not what, what I'm doing. And then he shares, my online bio will never say Mr. Agustin is the devoted husband and father to two kids, the whole white picket fence thing. I think there's value in that. Um, I was talking to Mr. Agustin the other day, you know, we're still in uh, good, you know, we're still in touch and just finished his master's degree. So shout out to Mr. Agustin, I was sharing, you know, that, that last quote, and I was, I was reading it back to him, you know, my online bio will never say 
um, you know, my husband and father, whole white picket fence thing. I said, that was one of the most impactful quotes in my story. And we were discussing that, how oftentimes uh, men of color educators are asked to, you know, share something personal about their life as if that's relevant professionally, that you might have an online bio where some credential you have is just to be married or to have kids, this imagination that you're succeeding what traditional manhood um, should look like. And Mr. Mr. Augustine was, um, um, easily identified that and noted his students say that that's not the path that I'm that I'm interested in. Um, overall, this uh, research has implications for youth programming. I think there needs to be a strong reevaluation of the boy of conversation in general, but with, with a critical analysis of um, racial capitalism, our racial politics and our, our gender politics. I think seemingly well-intentioned programs to reproduce uh, power structures that um, we seemingly would like to disrupt. Um, curriculum definitely has to look beyond individual character and focus on uh, structural critique. Um, and we need to move from a crisis response to a justice response. And I was thinking a, a lot about that in my last chapter, and I wanted to just share a few pieces from the last chapter. So I'm thinking about an abolitionist reframing. And I'm going to start here reading a bit. On March 29th, 2021, um, Adam Toledo, a 13 year old Latino boy, was shot and killed by Chicago police officer Eric Stillman in the Little Village neighborhood on the west side of Chicago. News of the killing made national headlines. I checked in with, with a few of the LMS mentors via text. We were all emotional and upset. Some posted heartfelt responses to the incident on their social media accounts. Others expressed anger and rage. However, most of all, the mentors, like perhaps many youth workers, shared feelings of fear and terror. They grieved for a child who reminded them so much of their own students. In the wake of Adam's death, however, debate emerged as to how his life and death should be understood and remembered. What narrative should we tell? One source of this narrative was national education leader, Arnie Duncan. Arnie Dunk uh, Duncan, who served as Secretary of, under, uh, Secretary of Education under President Obama from 2009 to 2016, uh, was a champion of neoliberal school reform before he had been CEO of Chicago Public Schools. And on April 16th, 2021, the morning after the video of Adam's murder had been released, Duncan tweeted, with all children like Adam Filippo, who might be struggling, it's up to all of us to mentor them, to guide them and nurture them. When we don't, the streets will. Every child is looking for their village, their community. We decide what they will find. We failed and the streets won. An explosion of angry responses began to circulate. Educators and community members alike called out the problematic and racist tweet the white liberal leader who had made a grand career being a champion of educational diversity. The tweet echoed news coverage that depicted Adam as a lost youth failed by his community whose actions led to an expected outcome. However, amid the grief and mourning, the Toledo family was compelled to issue a statement. They shared, we do, however, want to correct the hurtful and false mischaracterization of Adam as a, as a lonely child of the street who had no one to turn to. This is simply not true. Adam was a loved and supported 13-year-old boy. He lived with his mother, his 90-year-old grandfather, and two of his siblings. His father was in his life. They all loved him very much. The Toledo family is a close-knit family. They look after each other. Adam attended Gary Elementary School, where he had the support of his teachers and his classmates. Adam was not alone. The Toledo's family message pushed back against the discourse so common in understanding the loss of Latino boys. This was the same discourse that I'd heard over and over again to describe the need for programs like LMS. This statement recognizes the importance of narrative, that there is politics behind making sense of and interpreting this loss. This tragedy was not the doing of Adam, his family, or his community. It's had to be made clear. Refusing this deficit-based narrative assigned to young people in their communities means pushing back on the idea that there is something wrong and broken in them. However, this re refusal does not deny the culpability, that culpability and blame exists. It simply means that de the deficit has been placed in the wrong area. Despite all the debate and reflection on the story of Adam Filello, um, it was a police officer's bullet that killed him. This occurred in a country that spends an obscene amount of resources on systems of policing and punishment. This apparatus of control disproportionately targets, punishes, harms, and incarcerates boys and men of color. This illogical tendency to focus on and blame individuals for the violence institutions carrying out their expected functions reveals the great need for an abolitionist reframing how we seek to support young people and reimagine new forms of education beyond our current schooling system. 
and I'll go ahead and end there. So I, I appreciate y'all uh, listening. Thank you. I'm happy to resist maybe for some, some Q and A. Thank you, Michael. That was lovely. And uh, we have some time for Q and A either from the room or the Zoom Q and A function that uh, uh, our ISSI folks are looking at now. Um, I have a question. Okay, this is yeah. from Debbie. Yeah. Actually, we value some of that, otherwise the Zoom people can't hear. Um, Michael, so great to hear more about your work. Um, looking forward to reading the book as I can see your work has really evolved a lot since your grad. It was wonderful then. I can see it's evolved even more since then. Um, I don't remember hearing about, well, I'm just curious about more about Mr. Augustine and his students. Was he out to his students? And if so, how did that go? And if not, like, what did he say? Yeah, about that? Um, Mr. Augustine, you know, um, was, uh, um, you know, shared about his, his life and sexuality with his students. Um, he also self-described himself as not straight passing and felt like that was a powerful, um, he was a powerful role model to have for students, especially in his own community. He worked uh, not as his, not his, at his old high school, but um, just miles away from where um, he grew up. Um, and actually the story of Augustine, you know, I, I get into in his book. So we just had uh, two in-depth interviews and we've kept in touch, but I was not doing participant observations in this classroom. Um, however, it, um, in the second year of my research, the first year that he was in LMS, um, he was actually um, uh, asked to leave the school that he was at. Um, he had struggled, um, he described too, struggling with um, classroom management, you know, as we call it, and a, a teacher had walked by when uh, they felt it was disruptive. And while, you know, first year and second year teachers oftentimes get support and care. It's like, hey, you know, being a, a teacher is tough. Because the school had contracted it out, LMS, the seemingly, you know, again, under, you know, in the old school form, this kind of experts to come in and probably address a problem. They simply uh, called LMS and said, hey, this is not what we thought LMS would be. Can you switch our mentor? Um, so he was, he was um, still works for Pueblo Unido, or he did and still work for Pueblo Unido. He wasn't, you know, fired from his position, but he was removed from the classroom. Uh, which uh, he felt was never properly addressed. And, you know, I asked in our, you know, research responses if we should make a bigger ferry, how we wanted to handle it. He preferred not to um, proceed anything further. But yeah, it, it, it was stunning to me. Uh, um, yeah, in the book, I go into that in detail here, here not as much that um, he felt, um, and I would agree, some of the, the idea of having a Latino male mentor, you know, contracting out these experts because you, you know, you're controlling behavior, you know, in potentially, you know, what, what someone might imagine is unruly behavior. Um, and if you can't immediately do that, why do we, why do we have you here in the first place? Yeah. Thank you. If there are other questions either in the room or the Zoom. So far. I do have a question. Oh, yeah. Um, also, this is great, so I really appreciate it, you elaborating on this. Um, yeah. I, the one you didn't elaborate, so I'm wondering if you could maybe uh, elaborate a little bit more on like what a benevolent heteropatriarchy is and how did that manifest in your work, uh, just to touch on like another aspect of the book. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, so, you know, in today's age, you know, if, if you, uh, which I do, and it sounds like some of us do in this room, work with boys and men of color or, you know, uh, quote unquote, all, all male spaces in schools, no one's saying like, hey, we, we want to promote patriarchy or we don't we don't want students to respect women. Actually, that discourse is, is very much prevalent. And at, uh, oftentimes people say, you know, there's this phrase, you know, real men respect women, real men, you know, do this in kind of that notion of benevolent patriarchy is this idea that rather deconstructing manhood and the systems of oppression that, that create hegemonic manhood, we should reconstruct manhood in ways that create a kind of this sanitized um, figure of masculinity that fits well within heteropatriarchy. So it's not that we're wanting to disrupt heteropatriarchy, we're wanting to create a masculinity that fits well within it. And if uh, boys and men of color are not getting jobs and providing their family, you know, not participating in mon 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 monogamous couplehood, we're not, you know, coupling the way heteropatriarchy wants, but this program wants us uh, to not challenge those systems, but actually fit better within those systems. And I think uh, radical, um, just, uh, you know, critical 
feminist spaces uh, would point us to like, actually, let, let's deconstruct those systems rather than have, have men fit better in those. Um, good question. I took it like really personal because I was in that as well. Mm. Um, can you like elaborate a little bit on um, like the relationships between students and like um, male students and male mentors? Um, I, was in the, I was a female mentor and I was a mentor uh, to students both middle school, high school for two years. And I'm um, one like still remember since it was like pretty recent. I remember um, one of my students was like, "Well, I feel comfortable talking to you and like how I feel by my emotions," um, because kind of just because I was a woman, you know. And he and moved to the point where he was like, "I could um, never see myself crying to a man." Yeah. Like just kind of, and I remember I told my partner this, who is also now. And um, and I was like, for me, I just I couldn't understand it because I'm like, but they're kids, you know. And um, I'm like, hey, like I had a student tell me, and my partner um, told me he, he's also male. Um, he's like, that's why I haven't like um, sought out like therapy or something because the idea of just crying to another man just seems like just not not very manly of me. That doesn't, you know. So. Um, if you could just like elaborate a little bit what it was like male you know, to male yeah. and like the relationship uh, that they were able to form because we had male mentors and it was really hard to recruit male mentors for the mentorship program that I so it was honestly mostly female mentors um, and the few male mentors that we did have it was mostly like talking about it wasn't really going into like hey what's going on at home it was more like how are your grades Oh, did he watch the game last night? It was more like, um, it wasn't just more on the like in depth, I guess, I don't want to say like emotional side, but um, there was more vulnerability when it was a um, male student with a female mentor. And if you could just like elaborate. Oh, yeah, that. that's a good question. Yeah, and you know, this was an uh, in, in all male program, so we had all, all men and mentors. Generally, students had very close relationships with mentors, so I definitely don't want to diminish that. I, I, I know for years I, I've been in the, the spaces, and so students built lasting bonds with me, with other mentors. Um, it, it was, I, I, the, the love was clearly there, and in, in the book I, I, I underscored that, underscored that greatly. Um, however, sometimes we do reflect on how, how we bond with students. Oftentimes, you know, part of my findings in the study is that we're often positioned to bond in a certain way, you know, as men, and when you bring those ideas, you know, it can limit, especially early on in our relationship, how we how we discuss things. Um, also, you know, research, and I, I'd love, I'd love to conduct, you know, if anyone wants to collaborate with me, I'd love to cut more research that oftentimes when you look at research with um, boys of color reflecting on their most meaningful relationships in the classroom, it's not necessarily like only with the men in the classroom, you know, students have, you know, their favorite teacher, their favorite person on campus, you know, was was oftentimes women and so in some of these programs um the rationale in which we believe that uh, men are the proper mentors for boys in those conversations aren't necessarily you know 100 percent true when we look at uh you know uh, girl of color spaces i think the feminist rationale as to why these spaces are important really you know leans into social justice and for the all-male spaces, sometimes not as much. Um, sometimes not as much. And I think, as, as you mentioned, with expectations around the kind of, that can limit um, connections. Um, but definitely in my research, there was close connections. But um, I think those connections would have been with anyone who is there dedicated to connecting with them as students. It just happened to be um, all men in this program. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, oh, sorry. Um, I guess, like, um, I think, like, for your second comment, like, um, like, was it hard? Was there kind of like a cr criteria that the mentors have to meet? Because um, to be in like the study, um, because um, like some, I mean, it, it, I know it was like all men working with um, other like male students, um, so. Obviously, some males may be more conservative than other ones. Then, um, like, how, like, how does like that impact like the thoughts that were 
kind of, I just feel like mentors have just such a big influence on students and um, they, they obviously have an impact on students. So do you think obviously like if a man thinks that if they have to keep their word or they have to like, if they're like all about tough love, like uh, that's what a mentor values. Like how does, do you think it's like, how it does it affect the student? Like it's obviously yeah. that ideology is getting passed down. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and makes, oh yeah. De know? And definitely it's very limiting. It's very limiting. And in terms of criteria for being a mentor, I mean, you know, working in schools and working nonprofits, folks know there's like, you know, there's just a hustle to get bodies in the classroom. So it wasn't like yeah. this huge vetting, you know, you know, mentors, you know, youth workers are not making a ton of money either. So it's not like there's this huge vetting criteria of, you know, who, and oftentimes, I think what my research in this study and other studies find is, you know, there's this large educational imaginary. It's like, I don't care about your credentials as, you know, uh, older man, young boys, connect them. There must be something, some magic that will happen. And I think my study finds like, oh, you know, there just needs to be a much more care involved, just, Simply leaning into masculinity can be problematic. Um, yeah, there, there was such a range of uh, I, political ideologies among the mentors themselves. Uh, and I will say it yeah. was, um, it's difficult to make those mentors, at least for the program that I was. Yeah. A lot of people see it as kind of like, um, not like the, the stereotypical like corporate job where I want to be, you know, like there's there might be like, um, being a youth worker is usually kind of like associated with with being more dominated by like women. Um, but I don't know like that many youth workers, so I think that's very cool. And I did notice that um, a lot of uh, men of color look up to other men of color, and I do feel like they're more influential um, than female mentors because I was a female mentor. But it's kind of like obviously like since i don't identify as a male of color they might find it easier to relate to a male of color so i definitely felt like my students would connect more to the male mentors which is i feel like so important to just cause how can i be talking about like these issues that uh, men of color go to but then they might be like well how do you know You're, you don't know like what it's like to be me because i'm a man of color so i think it's um I really enjoyed your lecture because um, it was like a good, uh, I, I just really liked how it was all male mentors and like the relationship with male students since I came from like female, I mean, female mentors to male students. So. Oh, yeah. We have uh, questions from online uh, nice. from Mirna Santiago. Uh, Michael, are there any mentorship programs you know of that don't follow or fit the neoliberal model? Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I, not that I've been like involved like years of studying, but um, actually a, a, a old colleague here at Berkeley, uh, David Turner, uh, who's now at UCLA, um, has some research with a really good, also Uriel Serrano, uh, another um, sociology PhD uh, out there at UC Irvine, um, has research with a really awesome justice-oriented um, uh, boys and men of color space in Los Angeles. Um, I don't want to accidentally say the na name wrong, but I, I definitely refer folks to check out um, David David Turner and Uriel Serrano's work. Also, want to note. Um, and let me see if I can change my my slide here. You know, some folks ask me like, "All right, you have all, all these critiques. You know, well, what should we do?" And I, I always reiterate, you know, um, as a researcher, I was working, you know, working to give data back to the organization. We were working together to change curriculum. Oftentimes, in um, uh, nonprofits, there's just such high turnover and such little capacity that it's hard hard to make change. But I will note from this research, let me see if I can uh, change my slide. Um, from this research, I developed uh, what I call a practice brief. It doesn't look like it's gonna let me change the slide here. Oh, here we go. Um, let's see, maybe the same way. Oh, so I developed a practice brief. Um, Again, so that people could see it. I can change. Zoom no longer. Uh, sorry, folks, it's checking with the Zoom here. Um, here we go. Um, so there's um, a practice brief that I developed actually with uh, that UT Austin program I've mentioned, uh, Project Mills, that I do um, professional development with programs like this. Um, 
So uh, there's a, a PDF link at the bottom, but uh, these seven principles, you know, I, I wrote in kind of a listicle form, but you can easily offer to educators as, you know, what, what are some things that we should think about while we go uh, through mentoring programs? Um, yeah. Good question. Thank you so much for your presentation, first of all. And I'm curious about your chapter number six, Gary Father. Um, it was about engaging oh, yeah. anti blackness while mentoring Latin um, boys. And I was wondering how how that how anti blackness appeared in, in the mentoring and the consequences yeah. of that that you observed. That's a that's a great question. Um let me down so I think uh, folks can see us now or I'll stop sharing. There we go. Um, that's a great question. Um, this was not actually in, in my dissertation. It was something, you know, data that I had and, thing, you know, questions that I, I was thinking about um, that I, I added that chapter at the end. It was clear to me uh, that in some ways envisioning a positive Latino male role model for students in urban spaces, especially in California, it meant also uh, creating a distance or boundaries between urban blackness that was criminalized in our cities. If you, and again, th this research, research was done in California, but in a, any, uh, I believe you know, pretty much any district in California that has a large black population would also have a large Latinx population. So I'm thinking of you know, South LA, Long Beach, Compton, Inglewood, Oakland, Richmond, North and South Sacramento. Uh, in, to create mentorship programs in which we're imagining a positive Latino maleness, time and time again, it would be articulated against a deviant blackness. And one, you know, one point that I, I note in um, the study is how we interact with um, uh, black men role models. And so uh, former President Obama uh, was kind of like hosted up as this amazing role model, but uh, black members of the community were often seen as deviant or other. And so during my study, um, the rapper Nipsey Hussle had been killed. And students were very upset. You know, I'm, I'm a fan of Nipsey Hussle for his music, but also, also more broadly. And students were wearing t-shirts. We all have this big discussion and event about uh, the memory of Nipsey Hussle, a, a, a rapper. And the program really came down and said, why are you honoring, you know, this is not a good role model for students. Why are you, you know, and just really, you know, reiterate uh, anti-black, you know, anti-black markers of how we imagine uh, uh, rappers, young men, uh, people who have been involved in, in gangs. And so in that chapter, I, I look at the ways we imagine a positive Latino maleness that is always at odds with uh, blackness. Um, and then I also, you know, talk about ways in which we can think of solidarity. Again, the, the studies that I mentioned here in California and structural anti-black techno technologies of policing, of school, de of school defunding are also at work in Latinx communities and how can we build solidarity rather than kind of create distance? Um, yeah, good question. I have one more question that's kind of along those um, lines. So you mentioned a, a racialized divide between good and bad Latino boys. Do you mean a racialized divide just because it's about Latinos, or or was there something were they racialized were they racialized differently? And I'd love to hear more. About oh yeah, that. that's great. I in in that one it, it's more like in in the era of kind of multiculturalism, you know, you can create uh, racial, you know, rac racial divides within groups of, you know, criminalizing people in your community, uh, criminalizing uh, dress, voice, you know, they, 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 it'd be fascinating the ways in which a program meant to empower Latino boys could use the most traditionally racist, stereotypical language that's been weaponized against Latino boys in the program to say, you know, we are, we are not that, people think we're this, uh, don't be that, you know, I, and, you know, this is not new, you know, when we look at, you know, in my earlier chapters, when we look at the rise of the prison industrial complex and the rise of the nonprofit industrial complex, oftentimes they're using similar rationals and logics as to why incarceration or kind of youth contact and programming need to be had. Um, I can remember being in programs like D.A.R.E., you know, it's meant to help, you know, help you and get you to say, oh, I, I suspect people in my community or older kids or, you know, there's bad people out there. You need this classically racist language to describe people in your own, own group um, that perhaps people describe you uh, with. Um, yeah, so, so there was this idea that bad Latino men were out there. Let's not be them. And this program will help us do that. Um, cool. Michael, I, I, 
I'm thinking of something that may not have shown up in your chapters or analyses, but maybe it's something you've been thinking about for a possible future project. And I know you've consumed and read and analyzed feminist literature too. And so that the question I'm thinking of is when we reconstruct masculinity, a couple of examples of which is, let's say, to, to encourage vulnerability or to increase uh, ranges of emotion, a range of emotion. I guess, when is that really just describing femininity <laughs> or things we associate with women, right? So when is a reconstructed masculinity really is something that exists already, which is what we call femininity. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So wh when do we leave masculinity and have entered into the realm of femininity? And I'm just using femininity as the sort of uh, convenient antipodal term for masculinity. Yeah. And, yeah. What is a vulnerable man? Is, is that really about masculinity or we've stepped into something else? Yeah, and I argue it, it probably sh it shouldn't shouldn't be. And, and you know, when when I um when I give that workshop on the seven just discernitive principles for men of color, women, boys of color, um, that point where I have it is deconstruct rather than reconstruct masculinity is constantly kind of a, a hot topic, and we'll kind of go go back and forth, not in a bad way, but just in a you know listening listening to each other way, uh, because oftentimes programs really want to reconstruct manhood and invest in well, what positive qualities of manhood can there be? And we constantly get like, aren't those just positive human qualities or positive, you know, I don't, I don't see why, why we're attaching this to masculinity. Wouldn't it be better for students, you know, we use phrases like let students live their authentic self, you know, you know, kind of, kind of fluffy phrases here that I say, wouldn't it be positive to, wouldn't it be possible to live your authentic self if you kind of release this ideological baggage of manhood that we're constantly performing for one another? Uh, now that, then that gets back to the idea of like, well, you know, if we're in schools and we want to see much more games, do boys, however we're defining boy, uh, learn better in uh, gender exclusive spaces? And research is kind of mixed on that. So e even in that realm, you know, this idea that we need to be all together and reconstruct manhood together um, in some ways falls apart. But um, yeah, I, I much more follow along the lines of deconstruct rather than reconstruct masculinity. But that, that's the hot topic in, in yeah, in this, in these spaces, it's not it's not a it's not taking hold. You know, the idea of you know real men to eat, real men do that. You know, is is very much um, yeah. yeah. Uh, there is. I think this will be the last question. It's actually one twenty five. This is from Zoom. Glasses on. Any recommendations or conversation starters to empower the students to ask critical questions on the ways that they or their communities are framed. Yeah, oh, uh, I mean, that that's great. I mean, I, I was citing some of uh, Bettina Love's work here, but I mean, there's just so many uh, classically, you know, critical, uh, critical education just in general. We, what's stunning to me is there's no lack of great, you know, literature, you know, think of like early on in the 90s, uh, La Gloria Lassen Billings and culturally relevant pedagogy or, you know, Django Paris and culturally sustaining pedagogy. We have a lot of tools that are disposable to have critical dialogues with students. And yet, uh, a lot of these programs, you know, the professionalization of being a critical educator is taken away to be replaced with kind of a, a student manager or an attitude manager. Um, and I would argue, you know, that the mentors that I worked with had such, you know, had the ability to have such great conversations with students and sometimes did, but it's the program itself that just simply is not, is not pushing us to have those conversations. But for, you know, quick starters, I'm not who's asking that, but, you know, I just love going back to Gloria Gore, Gore, and Billings culturally relevant pedagogy. I think that gives me a lot of tools to just how to approach uh, students in classrooms. Yeah.